I'm Liz Davey. Thank you for joining me for a walk in the garden today. You're watching this on NCTV Norfolk Community Cable Television. We're in my herb garden and it is Valentine's Day already and uh, winter is almost non-existent this year. We've had very little snow so far. Now there have been marches and late Februarys where we've gotten dumped, but so far this year we've had a number of days that have been in the 50s and few days that are under freezing, all day at least. And right now we're in one of those days that's a little chillier. That's why I'm all bundled up. Uh, the herb garden is covered with oak leaves and that's going to protect it. It's also going to protect some of the pollinators that are hibernating underneath the leaves. And we will be cleaning it up later in the spring, but right now we're just gonna leave it alone. Yes, it looks messy, but this is the best thing for the plants that are underneath. The first thing we'll be harvesting from this garden will probably be the chives. And with a few 50 degree days, you can see that they are starting to emerge. When we get these warm days, some of the plants start coming up and it may be a little early. So I'm gonna leave the mulch on them a bit longer. And about next month, we can take it off and not rush things too much. But we will be getting some chives here, and that'll probably be our first herb harvest. So we're gonna leave it and let it sleep until a couple months from now. Now let's move over to the perennial garden. It's sleeping too. My gardens may be sleeping. Unfortunately, the deer are not sleeping and they're coming through on a regular basis. And there are a few plants they particularly like. And I'll keep up with my deer spray. I pretty much use this all the, way, uh, all the year around in Norfolk. And if you've gardened here very long, you know which plants they're gonna go after in your yard. And this is a uh, PJM Hyde rhododendron. And sometimes the deer will nibble on it. So I will just keep spraying it about once a month throughout the winter. Hollies they like as well. And so I also spray those. And back here I have an azalea, which right now, this is a deciduous azalea, meaning it loses its leaves. It has a few leaves on, on it, but for the most part it loses them. And the deer also like to nibble these nice tender shoots. So I'll keep some deer spray on that. The earlier you use the deer spray, the more likely you are to encourage the deer to seek alternate paths, and then uh, they won't be as big a bother in your garden. I try to come out to the garden every day. Uh, many days it's just to do things like pick up sticks that have fallen and move them to the burn pile. But uh, I tend to look around and see what's happening. We have grape hyacinth foliage that is looking a little greener. And occasionally I'll see some bulbs, bulbs that are starting to sprout. And I can cover those. I'm gonna move down the way in the perennial garden a little more. I've left the shoots of many of the later perennials standing. I did cut down the iris. I don't like cutting iris in the spring. It gets kind of gummy and messy. But I do leave these standing. Many of the beneficial insects will spend the winter in plants and plant stems. So I will leave these until next month or even April before I remove them. And these will be removed and put in compost or long-term compost. You can crunch or crush them up or shred them and compost them. The same is true of pretty much all the perennials. When the bulbs start to come up, the spring bulbs, tulips, daffodils, crocuses, that'll be the time to start cleaning up the garden. I do have my baskets, bushel baskets, filled with oak leaves, the rock on top. In, uh, I covered up the lavenders and the chrysanthemums. This gives them a little bit of winter protection. This area tends to get a bit of wind through it, and it really helps to keep them from uh, completely dying underneath. We'll remove those baskets when the days start to get warmer. Now we're going to move along and go over to the vegetable garden in a few minutes. The plant catalogs are now out. Uh, all the websites have loaded their nice 
some are selections. So it's time if you're going to order plants, get your orders in early. They will ship them when it's time to plant them in our area. But if you plan to order plants, they do run out of some of the selections. So be sure to check it out now, even though it's not time to plant right now. Everybody thinks in May they go to order things, summer bulbs and summer perennials and annuals, and find that their order cannot be processed because they've gone run out of stock. So get your orders in early. Don't worry, they won't come until they're ready to plant. Now let's go over to the vegetable garden. The vegetable garden has been prepared for winter. I have straw over the strawberries and the garlic that we planted in October, and also over the parsley. I did sneak out here in December and pick a little parsley. It was still good. We're looking forward to it re-sprouting. Parsley is a biennial, meaning it has a two-year life cycle. So if you put in parsley one year, you uh, can leave it, pick it throughout the summer, and then the next spring, if you leave it in the garden, it will come up again for early spring parsley. Then it wants to go to seed, and then it will die. That's its life cycle. And the seeds may come up next year. I usually plant new parsley every year, but I let the old parsley stay for an early spring crop. I've been picking up sticks. As I said, when I come out to look around the garden, I'm always picking up sticks. With trees, you always have branches that fall down, and we'll be doing some brush burning. Norfolk's burning season is from February 1st to May 1st, and you do need to secure a permit from the fire department, uh, and you have to go in person to get that permit. And then on the day that you wish to burn, you call them to see if the conditions are right for burning, and then you can burn some of your brush if you choose to do so. I usually make piles throughout the year, and then we have a couple days of brush burning in the spring. Uh, this is also after I do some pruning. You can start your pruning any nice day. If we get any more of these 50 degree days, 60 degree days, you can go out and start doing some pruning. It will uh, ease the time for later. Anything that is definitely that is broken or uh, split and needs to be removed, you can remove any time. But spring is the time to do most of your pruning. If you do fall pruning, it tends to cause on warm days new growth, and you don't want tender new growth that will eventually be frozen. So I do most of my pruning in the spring, and then I can burn my prunings too and get rid of them. If you haven't ordered your seeds for your vegetable garden or gotten them from the garden center, it's a good time to do that too because again they do run out. I have ordered my seeds uh, and I'm ready to do some planting and we'll talk more about these uh, milk jugs when we get inside and plant a few more. If you have bluebird houses make sure they're ready. Bluebirds come back really early around here sometimes late February early March so be sure your houses are cleaned out and ready for new occupants. Now I'm going to go over here and uh, we're going to pick some things to bring inside and hopefully get a little spring color inside. I'm going to come right towards you and move over here and pick a few pussy willows and forsythia. And the pussy willows, this is a good time to prune them if you can reach up that high. I have a taller pruner, but I'm going to pick a few of them. You can see some of them have started to come out. They, uh, warm days cause them to come out, and this is a sunny spot. The other thing I can pick is forsythia, and uh, again, this is a good time to prune it. Bring a few shoots inside. We'll put them in water and hope for some blooms in a week or so. So we'll take these inside and get a couple more shoots there. And if we don't have flowers on them, which we probably will, it looks like they have some good buds, but we'll at least get some green leaves. And with this weather, anything green is welcome inside. Now let's go back by the pond a little bit and see what's happening back there. 
There are some signs of spring coming in the shade garden. And I have little snowdrops that are also almost ready to pop out. Uh, again, we had a couple warm days. Today, it's, the foliage is kind of frozen down around, around them, but they are in the middle of a couple hellebores. And the hellebores are also starting to come up. If you look closely, they're kind of a dark red, but they're starting to unfurl. And these will be one of the earliest blooms in this garden after the crocuses and the snowdrops. But the snowdrops are actually starting to bloom. They're very early, very hardy, uh, and they come up, they will, are starting to spread. I started with one little clump. Now I have clumps throughout the garden. The birds will spread the seeds and they reseed by the wind as well. And so I will have snowdrops coming up here and there throughout the garden a little later on. Again, this one shows more signs, and you can actually see a bud on this hellebore. Hellebores are extremely hardy shade plants, and they offer nice foliage throughout the year and buds in the early, early spring. And the buds last a long time, the flowers last a long time, and they can also be used as cut flowers inside. Now moving back towards the pond, the pond is really pretty easy care right now. The fish are still there. They don't require food and they're moving very slowly. Being uh, amphibious, they, their metabolism is in tune with the environment and uh, they slow way down when it's cold. So they're just kind of floating around in suspended animation in the bottom of the pond. You can see them through the ice. The ice is not too thick at this time and actually, a couple days ago, there was no ice at all. I have an ice melter in the pond. This is thermostatically controlled, and it comes on when there is ice, and it makes, leaves a hole in the middle. Uh, gases build up in the pond from decaying organic material and fish waste. You'll get some uh, gases under the ice. If you don't have some way for those gases to escape, the fish will die. So. If you have fish in your pond, you need to have some sort of system. Some people keep an aerator going to keep some water flowing. It's the same idea as turning on a faucet if you have a sink that freezes underneath in the winter. And I prefer this. Uh, I just check to make sure that it's still working and that there is a hole in the ice. When there's snow, sometimes if the snow is really deep, I have to come out and shovel it off to make sure that it's still performing its job. My sunshed is way too cold for starting plants or keeping plants in the winter. It, the temperature goes down about the same as outdoors at night. Unfortunately, I did not insulate it or put in uh, glass that would be insulating. But the temperature during the day in there goes up to 60, 70 degrees. I just checked it and it's 60 degrees and it's only in the 20s out here today. It's a nice place to work in the winter, and I can work on some craft projects in there, but I can't put plants in until much later in the spring. It will prevent the plants from freezing when the temperatures get in the 40s at night, but it will not work when the temperatures go down to the minus numbers and the, even the low teens. Now, let's head on inside and see what we can do with some crafts and some things in the kitchen. I'll see you there. Because of the tall windows and the bricks that absorb the heat of the sun, this area tends to have the bulbs that I've planted here come up really early, and I'm seeing signs of that. I did put some pine branches on it to hopefully keep it colder so that they didn't come up too soon. It didn't work very well because I have crocuses, snow crocuses, that are starting to put on buds and uh, it won't take long for those just to come into bloom. Snow crocuses are a very early crocus. There are really two kinds of crocuses, and the snow crocus will bloom, I think it's crocus chrysanthus, will bloom very early, and this is one of those. The crocuses, the larger crocus blooms that you see a little later, is another variety, and those are also planted in here, and hopefully they will bloom a little later, because not many people are going to be out here in February to see the snow crocus bloom, but they are aptly named because they will bloom very early, even when it's snowing. 
I'm continuing to feed the birds out here. We've got little chickadees coming down to the feeder. They're the bravest of all. They will come right while you're standing here. They don't mind at all. And I've had plenty of cardinals and other birds. Uh, very enjoyable to watch them and feed them. If you do start feeding the birds, please continue to keep the feeders full. They come to depend on them and they really do miss it if there's no one there to feed them. So if you don't want to keep them full, just don't start. Uh, it's a mess out here with bird seed, but it will clean up in the spring and the birds really enjoy it and I like to watch them. Now let's go inside and see what we can cook up. I try to make a few seasonal decorations each year and since it's February, Valentine's is kind of the big event in February, so I'm making a few things. Today is Valentine's Day, but now that you're seeing this, it probably will be well past Valentine's Day, but that's okay. We can keep these decorations up throughout February and until we get ready for the next event, which will probably be St. Patrick's Day. I'm going to use just a few odds and ends of silk flowers and a grapevine wreath. I've already attached this to it. I like to put a wreath in my kitchen and I will use some wire and wire on some leaves and then the flowers and a bow. It's really pretty easy to put something like this together and it's a lot cheaper than buying one. And I've got a couple of leaves here and I'll just fasten the wire around it. At the bottom. And then around the back of the wreath and fasten them there. Incidentally, this is called paddle wire, and it is uh, very flexible, fine wire. It's available in craft stores, florist supplies, and it's very easy to use and cut with kitchen scissors. And then I'll just put a few of these silk flowers on, and again, wire them in place. You could use hot glue. But I might want to use this wreath frame for something else, so if I use the wire, all I have to do is untwist the wire and I will have them for another use. And nestle these little leaves down below, and then we'll put a ribbon on it. And again, I've tied the ribbon and put wire on it. I can just wire that right in and twist it through the grapevine, and we have a little door decoration. And straighten out these leaves a little bit at the base. And we'll hang that up a little later. I've also made this one with wood. I've cut a wooden heart and painted it, and uh, then antiqued it a little with a little stain so that it has kind of an antique finish. And used a wire for a hanger, which I've twisted with a pair of pliers, and then glued on some sticks. And these are uh, branches of lilac, which have a lot of little twiggy branches. Blueberry also works well for if you want little twigs. And then I glued a little star on top of that. This is going to hang outside my front door uh, for the spring season. I've taken down my Christmas decorations. I really didn't want to leave those up. And it's a little too soon to put out the spring things. They look a little strange to have daffodils and crocuses out when you still have winter outside. So that'll go on the front door. Now for inside, I wanted some uh, color. So I bought a just one bunch of carnations, red carnations, $3.99. And I made two arrangements using uh, my little planter here. I put some red ribbon around the base of it and the three bottles, which can hold your garden flowers in the summer. I put in some branches, which I spray painted white. And if you saw my Christmas show that I did, I used these with greens in the winter 
and I've put them in just with a few red blooms and a few little hearts just on the branches for Valentine's Day. Later on, I'll just take the hearts off, probably, and just leave the flowers for a little bit until they're gone. These little mini chrysanthemums, once cut and put in water, will last quite a long time. I've added some straw flowers to these. These are straw flowers I grew in the garden and saved and put a wire in each one. And so they can be added to a few fresh flowers. You can combine dried and fresh as long as you have a wire. If you have your stems, the stems will get wet because you need the water for the fresh flowers. So if your uh, straw flowers or dried flowers are wired, they can go right in here. They can even be saved for another arrangement later once these little carnations are gone. And let me move this and we'll do a little gardening. I have a lot of house plants, and these are amaryllis. If you've got an amaryllis at Christmas time, they come as a bulb. Sometimes they're even planted for you in a pot. And most people, after they've bloomed, they go in the garbage. They don't need to. These are amaryllis that I've had for several years. This one has a nice bud on it right now. I keep them from year to year. They will not bloom every year for me. I, I neglect them in the summer pretty much, but they will, they can come into bloom. Now last year I have five bulbs that I've saved, and last year they all bloomed. This year one of them is blooming. And I will just keep them planted now and keep them watered and in a sunny window. And the foliage will continue to grow. This one's going to bloom. Once it blooms, I'll cut off the stem. And then let them grow, put a little fertilizer on them. I'm starting to add fertilizer in a half quantity to all my watering of house plants at this time. At the last two months, they received no, no fertilizer at all because they were kind of in a winter mode where they were not growing very fast at all. Now they're starting to perk up with the sunnier days. Anyway, the amaryllis will stay in the pot until it's nice and warm, probably about Memorial Day. And then I'll plant them out in the garden in an out-of-the-way spot, but keep fertilizing them and keep the sun on them, and they'll continue to grow wonderful foliage, and it will give strength to the bulb that's underneath. Then, in the fall, I will bring them in and let them die back, and then they can be replanted about next November, December, and you start to water them again after they've had a time of dormancy, and you will get blooms again. So you can keep growing amaryllis. Uh, all of these I received as gifts at one time or another or purchased, and uh, I've kept them over quite well. Occasionally they will run out of steam, and then you just replace them. This one was given to me as a gift this year, and it's a little different because it was encased in a wax material. And it's been very interesting to watch. I've already had one bloom on it that I cut off, and it was about this tall. And now it's putting out a second bloom. This one requires no water, and it basically can just sit about any place, and it will bloom. It has all the energy it needs within that bulb. I suspect that this is not a bulb that I can save. I may try it, but I suspect that it has used all of its energy to make the two flowers that it did. And it doesn't seem to be putting up too much in the way of leaves. There's one leaf coming at the bottom. But uh, it needs the leaves to give the energy to the bulb to restore it. These are the things that we brought in. And we'll have some flowers on the forsythia. And the, the uh, pussy willows will continue to come out. I've put them in water. And we'll leave them in kind of a shady spot later on. Now I'm going to plant some seeds. And you notice the milk jug sitting out in my vegetable garden. And this is the way I like to start a lot of different seeds. And today I'm going to be uh, starting some Nicotiana and also some cabbage. And we'll start with the impatient or the Nicotiana flowers. And the first thing I'm going to do is use a milk jug, and you don't want the one that you can not see through. It has to be 
somewhat transparent. And I'm using a ice pick. You can use a screwdriver or a nail or anything else you can find to make some holes in the bottom of this milk jug. And then I'll make one right about a third of the way up and then use the scissors to cut it. And I'm making a mini greenhouse. The Garden Club did this at the library the end of February or the end of January. And we had a, a nice turnout of people planting some of the native plants. It works very well for perennial plants or native plants. And perennials are the ones that return each year. You want to be sure you leave about a half an inch of, let's see, I need a little less here. You want a hinge. You need a little hinge on this uh, base of the jug. Make sure you put holes top and bottom. If you don't put holes in, it will get waterlogged outside. The next thing I'm going to do is use a germinating soil and put it in this bottom thing. I've moistened the soil. I buy this in bags when it, and it's dry and then I put it in uh, plastic containers, big plastic baskets and uh, wet it. So this is nice and moist and I'll pat it down and plant my seeds. This will work with broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, uh, many of the uh, flowers, milkweed, butterfly weed, delphinium. Many, many flowers and vegetables can be started this way. Now this is a very fine seed and I'm going to just lightly sprinkle some. You don't want to get it too thick. But I'll just sprinkle these around. And my package says do not cover the seeds. I think there's about 300 seeds in this tiny envelope at least. I may start a few more of these later on. I'll press these down and then one of the more important things to do is to label it. And I put a label both inside and outside because sometimes they kind of wear off. So I'll put one label there and then I'm going to use duct tape and all you need is one little strip sticky stuff And we'll just fasten it closed and then label it again up here or on the side. And then this will join the other jugs out in my garden. And yes, it is cold. It's going to be very cold tonight and I expect it will be cold for another month. But that's just fine. We're going to forget about all these jugs for now and just let them stay outside. It will rain on them, it will snow on them, and the sun will shine on them. And when the time comes for them to see it, to come up, they will. It's like magic. You really don't have to do much more with them, unlike seedlings that you start in the house. It works for most perennial seeds. Shasta daisies would be one. And a lot of the things that will self-seed outside in your yard. Uh, some of the uh, Verbenia bonariensis would be an example. But it's also good for vegetables. Now, you don't want to start your tomatoes and peppers yet this way. Those need to wait until it warms up. But a lot of these plants can take a little cold. And 
Some of them even prefer cold, like or cool temperatures, like cabbages. And I'm going to plant some mini red cabbages. And again, now this one doesn't have as many seeds. And I only want to put in about six. The first year I did it, I thought, well, they might not grow, so I planted them a little too thick, thickly. And now I've learned that germination's pretty good, so you don't have to plant too many. If you plant too many, it's kind of hard to get the seedlings out to plant in the garden. And I think I have how about nine in here, little plants. The nice thing about this way of doing it is that you do not have to harden the plants off. Normally when you start things inside, you need to put them in and out for oh, maybe a week or so before you can actually plant them in the garden. These will kind of harden off on their own. And again, we want to mark it. And And once I have the seedlings, then we can put them in the garden. This will be probably about April. But it is a good way to start a lot of plants. Again, the more tender perennials, you probably would seed in the garden anyway, like zinnias, but you can put them in. I would wait another month or so for those. There are some very good uh, online Tutorials on this that will give you lists of seeds that can be done this way. It's particularly good for native seeds, and I will put in a plug for the library seed library since I work on it some, and it is ready for people to come and start taking out seeds from our seed library. This is its second year. We have a nice selection of vegetable and flower seeds, and a new section this year called native plants. And we have seeds that have been collected by the Garden Club of Norfolk that are all native to this area, and it's an excellent way to start those in these milk jugs right now. And we'll put red cabbage on it. And again, I have a few more seeds. I may decide I want a few more. These will go out then and join the other jugs that are sitting in the garden next to the fence. And on warm days, uh, when it gets to be about April, we can uh, pull the tape down and open it up when we see seedlings coming. If it's a nice sunny day, we can give them a little more sun. And they'll do just fine in these containers. Now the next thing, last fall I took a lot of cuttings and I put about three cuttings in each of these pots right into pure compost. Well, they pretty much all took, and so I've been busy lately dividing these and repotting them so that they can continue to grow. They're kind of running out of nutrients at this point, and these are labeled pink. They're geraniums, but they are labeled pink because I have white ones too, so I just labeled the pink ones so I know what they are. And I'm using a transplanting soil for these. And I'll basically put a little of the, the transplant soil in each pot. And then you'll see I have pretty good roots on these. These were just cuttings that were done. And this is moist soil, but we'll give these a nice drink after I finish this, just to get them planted in. And this will give them some nice fresh soil. And once they get established in these new containers, I can start giving them a little fertilizer mixed in with the water as I water them. 
and they'll be ready to bed out in about May or put in pots outside and each plant will become a large plant later on. And so we'll label each of these with their labels so that I'll know when I go to put them in pots what color they're going to be. That pretty much does it for our potting and gardening, indoor gardening. Of course, I am watering my plants a little more frequently. Uh, they are starting to show signs of growth and I have all the cuttings that I've put in pots. And I've started out, I've got a number of them under my light tower. Uh, these will move over near a window later on because I want to start some seeds under the lights as well. Some of the flowers that are more tender, I start outside, inside rather than outside in the milk jugs. So let's go into the kitchen and see what we can cook up. Today we're going to be making some things for a Valentine's dinner or just a, a fancy dinner, maybe an anniversary or a birthday dinner. Uh, making it a little fancier but not too difficult, not too much last minute. Uh, it goes together pretty fast and could be adjusted definitely for four people or more. I'm going to start with a French asparagus tart and I'm going to mix uh, three eggs. I'm going to beat those just with a whisk. And we're starting this part earlier because this needs to go in the oven for a while. And a half cup of cream. And salt, about a half a teaspoon of salt. And lemon zest. This is the zest of one lemon. And I'm gonna whisk this all together to make a custard. Just a few gratings of pepper, too. I've already prepared a tart shell and I've baked it part way. This is just pie pastry. You could buy it if you don't feel like making it or don't wish to. And I'm going to add a cup of Swiss cheese at the base of this. and sun-dried tomato, and I need a spoon for this. And these are the tomatoes that I roasted last summer from my garden. I uh, roasted them with a little olive oil in the oven and then put them in the freezer. So they're, they're somewhat dried. Got most, much of the moisture from them. And I'm gonna put those around inside the tart. And then I'll pour in the custard. Spread it around a bit. And then the next step is some asparagus. And I've used just the tops of the asparagus. I saved the rest. I can mix that with pasta later. And I'm going to set those. I cut them three and a half inches so that they would fit around the edge of the tart. And we'll make a, a spoke with them. These have been blanched. In other words, I put them in the microwave for about two minutes and then ran cold water on them to stop the cooking. So they're partially cooked. Asparagus is starting to come on the market now that's grown more locally. I used to have an asparagus patch. Unfortunately, it had to make way for a new septic system, so I no longer have an asparagus patch. But I do find asparagus, and I like to buy local if I can. Right now, it's coming from south of here. Now this is going into the 375 oven for about 30 minutes. And I put it on a pan because I don't like to clean the oven very well and in case it overflows, I have 
some backup. And while that's baking, we'll do some other things. Now, and I'm going to plug this in so it heats up. The first thing I'm going to make now is a dip for an hors d'oeuvre. And this is a red pepper dip. And I'm going to use, I need to drain these a little more there, a block of cream cheese, which I have in my food processor, and then a can of roasted red peppers. These are not hot, they are very uh, sweet, roasted sweet peppers. And you, if you froze sweet peppers that you grew, you could probably use those as well. Roast them, or you can roast fresh ones, or use canned, which is a lot easier at this point. I'm going to add a half a cup of mayonnaise. And some dry mustard. One teaspoon. Dry mustard is the one that comes in the little yellow box. This adds a little pungency to the dip. We'll also add a half teaspoon of crushed garlic and three quarters of a teaspoon of salt. And again, a few shakes of pepper will be nice in it too. And one third cup parsley. And I, have, I can keep parsley in my refrigerator until about December from the garden, but after that I do have to buy it. But I keep it the same way, in a glass jar, washed and put into a glass jar. The jar has to be glass, not plastic. If you put parsley into a plastic jar or plastic bag, it will disintegrate rather quickly. But in a glass jar, it keeps for quite a long time. And we're going to spin this all together for a dip. probably need to scrape it down at least once. And we leave it a little bit chunky. Not too, too much, but just a little. And I'll add that to a, a serving bowl. Okay. The cream cheese was at room temperature. That's reasonably important. And I'll add this to my little serving bowl. And we may be able to get it all in after all. And this dip will go on the table a little later. And I'm going to move that out of the way. And we'll make some dessert. I'm going to start with a teaspoon of unsweetened jello. Jello is not the only thing that there is. Before Jell-O, there was 
unsweetened gelatin and I'm going to use a teaspoon of it. Each package contains more than that, probably about a tablespoon. And I'm putting it on top of one tablespoon of water to soften. You can make your own jello with fruit juice using unsweetened gelatin. Or the, it's just, just gelatin. There's no sugar in it. It's unflavored and you need to add flavor to it. But it will help stiffen things and You add some cold water to soften it, and uh, you want to make sure it's, and it's already getting a gelled consistency. As you can see, it gets a little gummy. And then I'm going to boil some water in the microwave. It's the easiest way to do it. Just put it in for a minute. And There we have some water that's at least close to boiling. And we'll add that now to dissolve this gelatin. And I'll add two tablespoons of the hot water. And I want to stir that around. And you'll see that it dissolves the gummy softened gelatin. Make sure it's all dissolved. Or else you'll have lumps of gelatin in what you're making and that's not very appealing. The next thing I'm going to make is a chocolate mousse. And this is a very easy chocolate mousse recipe. There are hard recipes, but uh, I like easy. And this one is pretty easy to make. We've got our gelatin ready. And I have a half cup of sugar and one quarter cup of cocoa, just uh, unsweetened cocoa, the kind that comes in the brown can. It's just fine. Or if you wish to use a Dutch process, you can also use that. We're also going to add a teaspoon of vanilla. and a cup of heavy cream. I'm going to start out on slow and then I'm going to beat this until it uh, thickens and it will become stiff. This will take a little bit.
add one more time. Now I'm going to add the gelatin mixture to this as it uh, and beat it in to this mixture and then we'll be finished. And I'm going to spoon this then into dessert glasses. And ideally we would put this in the refrigerator for half hour to an hour. And it will last several days with the gelatin. It will uh, cause it to firm up a bit, quite a bit. Let's see, we have four more, two more glasses. So make enough to serve four people. And where we spilled a little, we can just wipe it off the edge. These again can be refrigerated until they are served. And I'm going to serve these with a little cookie and we'll uh, move those over when our other things are done. The last thing I'm going to do are some lamb chops. And uh, these were on special. Every once in a while I find them, we like them. And so what I've done is marinate these in a mixture of, of uh, olive oil, tablespoon of olive oil, two tablespoons of balsamic vinegar, a tablespoon of honey mustard, and some chopped oregano, which I also managed to find. I have uh, one rosemary plant and I have been taking sprigs off of it. Uh, I have trouble sometimes keeping it in the winter. This year I put it on a tray of pebbles and have kept those pebbles damp to give it the humidity that it craves. Uh, rosemary is a Mediterranean type plant. It likes a lot of humidity and it doesn't like to dry out, but if it's too, if you wet it too much, it will rot. So it, it's kind of a tricky thing to keep it in the house over the winter. Some people have great luck with it. I haven't until this year. This is the first year I've been able to keep one going. So far, so good. And then I can put it back outside in the summer. Anyway, I've marinated these lamb chops for a while. These are fairly thick, and I'm going to just grill them. You could also grill steak, salmon, whatever your main dish is. And I'm just using the Foreman grill for these. And we'll grill them until the internal temperature is about 100, over 145. They're kind of thick, so it may take a little while. But the grill will grill them on both sides. Now in a few minutes, I'll join you in the dining room, and we can put our meal together. OK, now we'll put everything together for our meal, for Valentine's Day, a special anniversary, maybe a birthday. And we have our lamb chops, which were finished in the grill, and I've garnished those with a little fresh rosemary. The asparagus tart, 
which has a nice custard, lemony custard base with the asparagus. And for our hors d'oeuvre, I should have mentioned that first, I guess, uh, raw vegetables with the red pepper dip. And I also made some crackers using a heart cutter. Again, you could use purchased crackers just as easily. The chocolate mousse, which is setting up nicely. And I'm garnishing that with a chocolate shortbread cookie. I made them, but again, you could use uh, one of the pirouette cookies that you can buy or one of the other cookies to serve with it. Our nice bottle of red wine, and we have dinner for two. Ready for Valentine's Day, I've put the centerpiece on the table. Just a small centerpiece is, is sufficient, and uh, it needs to be, if we had guests, we would want to have one that we could see over so we can see the person that's sitting across from us. This has been a walk in the garden. I'm Liz Davey, and we're being shown on NCTV, Norfolk Community Cable Television. Join me again next month for another show in this series.